Yes, Mr. Christian, and as you were saying when the alarm went off. Yes, uh, my lords, my lady, I'm very pleased to see that such flames as they were didn't reach us here. Um, I was just addressing you on paragraph 62 and 62A of the particulars, and I'll yes. come to that in just a moment, but I did just want to go back to my Lord, Lord Justice Males's question about the umbrella damages, just to complete the picture. I've checked the defence, and we have pleaded in paragraph 47 of the defence that we reserve our right to contend uh, that in this case, um, the umbrella purchases are too remote for sound in damages, but, but that isn't a point of principle about umbrella purchases in general. It would have to be about the supply chains and such as evidence as there is in yes. this case. Okay. And the reference okay. for that in case uh, you're interested is Core Bundle, tab 14, page 199. The place I want to be is the supplemental bundle um, at page 168 in tab 6, which is the interest pleading. And the point that I was about to make before the break is that you can see at paragraph 62 an utterly conventional um, claim for compound interest under the rule in, in SEMPRA, you can call it that, which is throughout the relevant period. Um, and you might remember that was defined, I think, back in paragraph 5 as being the, the period during the cartel in which the claimants were still trading. So during that period, it said that they borrowed money from banks and other creditors, and interest was payable at prevailing rates, and so um, they claim loss of use of money, um, effectively, in respect of that period. And that's not the subject of this appeal. That wasn't the subject of my application to strike out at first instance. Um, my application was directed at the period after that, um, for which they claim compound interest in equity. And you can see that is the pleading that is now set out um, in these draft re 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 I think amended particulars um, at, at paragraph 62a. And my learned friend has already taken you through that, so I'm not going to, to read it out again. But if I can just summarize what I take from it. In sub paragraph A, it is said that the cartel plus concealment of the cartel plus the serious and intentional nature of the cartel together caused the claimants to pay too much to somebody. Um, it's not alleged that it caused them to pay too much to my clients or even to any of the cartelists. That's just not the nature of the allegation. And then at B, it, it's pleaded that the cartel plus the concealment plus the overcharge caused my clients, that's right, my clients, um, to benefit from the cartel. But again, it's, it's not alleged that they benefited at the expense of the claimants, or that they benefited by receiving the claimants' money. It's not a direct link, is it? It's an, it's an indirect proposition. Well, m m lady, no, it's, it's, it's not even that. What they're saying is that my clients benefited on transactions at which they sold L LCD panels to someone else, you know, to someone in Taiwan um, or to someone in Europe mm. or whoever. And, and then entirely separately from that, so that, that, that's, that's my client's alleged benefit, mm. entirely separately from that, the claimants suffered a loss by making purchases from other people. Isn't that your umbrella? Isn't that the whole point of your um, the way the um, not yours of the, the umbrella claim, which is that you infect the whole market by that, having a cartel prices that, right. go up across the board? Uh, absolutely. So there is an allegation of a causal link hmm. between the cartel hmm. and the harm that they suffered, and between the cartel and the benefits that my clients obtained. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's not being alleged that they're the other sides of the same coin. No, no. That mm -hmm. that they um, paid money to us which we retain. Um, the that, the, the that loss does not correspond to the benefit, basically. It, exactly. That's the point you're making. Your Lordship has put it much, much more clearly than I, than I did. Yes, that's exactly it. Um, and they, they then say at C that the concealment enabled us to obtain and retain those gains. Um, and in, a, in the premises, they say, um, we obtained and or retained money as a consequence of the cartel or the concealment. Um, but you, you have the point 
that um, it's not alleged that we obtained or retained money belonging to the claimants. And so that sets up my the claimant's money point. Um, and I just identify as well that the conduct that they say constitutes the fraud, and they don't say it in those terms, but that seems to be what they're, what they're doing here. The conduct is the cartel, the concealment, and the serious and intentional nature of the, the cartel. Um, so with that, that established or seen, I'm going to move on to what I call the claimant's money point, uh, respondent's just, notice. Just, just before we leave this yeah. paragraph, um, it may not matter, but the cartel period is 2001 to six. That's right. And the, the relevant period is different for the different subset times. of the yeah. cartel period. Correct. Before the claimants cease trading. Correct. Administration 2002, liquidation 2004. It's, it's different. It's different, different for different claimants. claimants. If I can just give you, I'll give you notes so you can see it later. It was paragraphs 16, 20, and 24 set out the dates for each of the, the claimants. Yes. But anyway, it's a subset of the right. cartel period, which is That's right. to six. That's right. And it seems, I mean, th it does point to another sort of oddity. It, it, it seems that their, their, their complaint is that we, the benefit that they're, they're claiming is just all the benefits that my clients got from the cartel, irrespective of whether they were in the relevant period or not. I mean, that's a small point. The, the, the main point is the benefits are not the other side of the coin from the claimant's losses. It's a discount. And, and for the purpose of looking at the claimant's losses, it won't matter, presumably, whether, as the Commission suspected, the cartel went on beyond February 2006, because by then, all of these particular claimants were at sea trading. True, and in any event, it, it, because it's a pure follow-on damages claim, um, they're not alleging um, right. that it went on any further, as it happened. Yeah. As it happened. Um, so with that, I'd like to start with the claimant's money point, my respondent's notice point. And that really takes as its kicking off um, point, launching pad, the decision of this court in Black and Davies which is tab 15 um, in the authorities bundle. <coughs> Sorry, I'm working electronically, but I think from memory that was from bundle two. Um, yes. Tab 15. And my learned friend has already summarized the facts, so I won't, I won't go over that. Um, uh, if we could pick it up from page 444, which is where the cross appeal on compound interest is dealt with. And if we could just look at, at paragraph 80, I, I know my learned friend took you to it, and he, he fairly made the point that, um, we made the point which, which I accept, that um, this issue, the compound interest issue, is strictly obiter because of the decision that the court had reached on the main claim. Um, and it's also true that there were no oral submissions because the parties were content to rely on their written submissions, which were also supplemented post-hearing, we're told. But the point I just want to note um, is that the reason why the court dealt with it at all is said here because the question is one of general importance. In other words, the court went to the trouble of considering all of those submissions and the judgment of the learned judge at first instance so that the point would then be of assistance in other cases. Um, so that, that's the point of background that I wanted to make. Uh, I don't need to traverse the paragraphs that, that follow, um, save for the, the critical paragraph, I think, which is paragraph 87. Um, on page 447. And the context for this paragraph is that the, the court is trying to explain um, what Lord Brown Wilkinson um, was saying in, uh, um, in, in the passage that is reproduced immediately above. Um, and my learned friend took you to this, and so I'm, I'm not going to read it out again, but, but uh, this, this paragraph makes three points. The, the first of them is, I think, not controversial. 
And that is that the judicial count in West Deutsche, if I can put it that way, was 3-2 um, in favor of Lord Brandon's formulation um, of the scope of the equitable jurisdiction toward compound interest from La Pintada. Um, so you get that from um, the first half of the paragraph. Three, not two of their lordships, were firmly of the view that the equitable jurisdiction to award compound interest was limited to the two categories of case identified by um, Lord Brandon. The second point is that when applying that formulation to the facts of Mr. Black's claim, what the court said was that the claim for compound interest failed because the fraud, um, or would have failed, because the fraud did not cause Mr. Davies to obtain and retain money belonging to the Black Party. Again, um, you can see that two sentences on. M my learned friend makes the point, well, they didn't need to say that. They could have said um, it fails because Mr. Davies personally, as distinct from the company he was the managing director of, didn't benefit from the fraud. And that's, an, that's a different reason they could have given to reach the same conclusion that they did. And you know, that might be so. I mean, Mr. Davies must have had some, some reason um, commit the fraud, but we don't need to worry about that because what's in front of us is the, is the analysis of the Court of Appeal in this case, which was that the reason it failed was because Mr. Davies did not obtain and retain money belonging to the Black Party. And then I also draw attention to the final two sentences um, to say that in, in that state of affairs, so in any case, whether the defendant did not obtain and retain money belonging to the claimant, that case is covered by the decision of the majority in West Deutsche. And so far as this court, as in the Court of Appeal, is concerned, that is an end to the compound interest question. It cannot be reopened at this level of decision. So if that reasoning is correct, if what is said in this paragraph is correct legal analysis, then that is also the end of this appeal. Um, so to put that in another way, in order to succeed in this appeal, my learned friend needs to persuade you that the unanimous Court of Appeal in Black was wrong in its understanding of what was decided in La Pintada and West Deutsche um, over the preceding pages that I've, I've not gone over to. And I, I accept that it is open to my learned friend to attempt to persuade your lordships um, and your ladyship that the Court of Appeal was wrong in its interpretation of those decisions, because this part of the judgment was overturned, so it's not formally binding. But I do say that the court should be very cautious about doing so, because it, it was a unanimous court of appeal, um, and they gave judgment on this issue, um, notwithstanding that it was overturned, expressly because the point was of general importance. Um, and uh, I'm not aware of any instance in which their reasoning, um, any aspect of their reasoning here, has been challenged in the years since the decision was handed down. Um, now, uh, obviously that's not enough. I'm going to have to go on and explain why I say they were right. But that is the starting point. I do say that the Court of Appeals should be cautious of overturning um, even the, the overture um, of uh, the Court of Appeal in a case like this, where it is very careful over to, it's not an offhand remark. Um, this is carefully reasoned for the purpose of providing guidance to the parties that appear before these courts. Um, and that's us. Um, but I I in my submission, the, their understanding, their Lordship's understanding of La Pintada and West Deutsche is obviously correct. And you can approach this from a number of angles. But I, I just want to start by thinking about what the rationale for the award of compound interest in this category um, in equity could be, the fraud limb. Because it, it's common ground that if the fraudster did not benefit from the fraud at all, because the fraudster did not obtain and retain any money from the fraud at all, then equity will not award compound interest. My learned friend is not trying to say that equity awards compound interest in any case in which there's been fraud. He accepts that he has to show that the, that the fraudster obtained and retained money. So the mere fact that the fraud caused the claimants to, to suffer loss is not enough to engage the jurisdiction. 
And what that tells us is that the rationale for the award of compound interest in this category is not to punish the defendant or, or simply, um, it's maybe part of it, but it's not simply to express the court's disapproval for the serious and deliberate wrongdoing that was involved in the fraud. There's something more going on here. Um, we, need, we need to understand the rationale for the obtained and retained requirement. And if we look again at paragraph 87, six lines down, we can see that this court explained um, what they thought it meant. Um, they said, in other words, where the fraudster has had in hand a fund which he has or is deemed to have made use of for his own benefit. So it's the fact that the defendant has had the fund in hand that's critical. Why is that critical? Well, if the money belongs to the claimant, it's easy to understand why that's critical, why it makes all the difference. Because if the defendant is holding the claimant's money by reason of a fraud, then of course the defendant should have to account for the value of having held that money, whether or not the claimant suffered any loss of use of money. Because equity will require a defendant to disgorge the profits that the defendant has earned, or is deemed to have earned, from holding the claimant's money just like the, the courts of equity would do for a trustee that has misapplied um, trust funds belonging to the claimant. Indeed, uh, I say it, it's no accident that the other category of case in which compound interest is awarded in equity is precisely that, where a fiduciary has withheld or misapplied trust funds. Again, it surely goes without saying that there have to be trust funds belonging to the for which the beneficiary is the claimant. Um, the two situations, the fiduciary on the one hand and the fraudster who has been holding the claimant's money um, on the other hand, have in common the fact that equity requires the defendant to account to the claimant for its profits. But that is not true for a mere tort visa who has caused the claimant to suffer loss, even if the tort is fraud. And, and, and that's common ground. And that is why it, it's not enough that the fraudster has benefited in some way from the fraud. Um, I mean, of course, as I say, in almost every case, the fraudster will have benefited from the, the, the fraud to some extent. People don't usually commit frauds for no reason. Um, but equity only imposes a duty to account where the fraudster has been holding the claimant's money. And it, it, it's not only... So I, I've just shown you that that's what this court thought in Black and Davies. But it's not only Black and Davies that supports that understanding um, of what Lord Brandon said way back in um, La Pintada. We can go even further back than La Pintada. We can go all the way back to um, Johnson, which my learned friend showed you. Um, if we just go there, it's tab six. So it must be in the first authorities bundle. And I, I can go straight to the paragraph that my learned friend took you to and placed weight on to see very fairly explained um, the facts. Obviously, that, that was a case where the defendant had been holding the claimant's money. Um, but that, that was the fact pattern that uh, the Privy Council was considering here. So as I say, it's page 111. And if we just look at the way, look again at the way the point is put in the penultimate paragraph, you can see reference to money obtained by fraud and retained by fraud can be recovered with interest. So I, I want to pause there for a moment. Um, th th there was a lengthy, or perhaps not lengthy, but repeated series of exchanges with my learned friends, um, uh, my learned friend, about whether uh, it's retained by fraud and also retained by fraud, as in you need both of them, or whether it's good enough that it's one or the other and it's disjunctive. And in my submission, the language is um, obtained and retained by fraud in Lord Brandon's speech, and that's, that's what he meant. Um, and I, I don't understand the submission that two ands add up to an or. Um, but, but really, my submission on this is that that, that is actually beside the point. Um, that, that's not, it's not relevant to the question of, of whether it needs to be the claimant's money or not. Because look at the words that follow this money obtained, retained by fraud, can be recovered 
with interest. That's what Lord McNaughton says. And th that makes two things clear. The first thing is that the use of the verb recovered makes clear that they're talking about a situation where the claimant's money has gone to the defendant. Don't worry whether by fraud or whether it was only held there by fraud. There's one way or the other. What the claimant is trying to do is get the claimant's money back. That's what the word recovered means. But there's a second point um, that is clear from the way that this is expressed, which is that it's recovered, as in that money, the money that was obtained and retained by fraud, that money is being recovered with interest. So the interest is being applied to the same money that was obtained and retained by fraud. The Privy Council was not talking about a situation in which the defendant has obtained one set of money by fraud over here from person A, and then separately person B comes along and sues the defendant for interest on some other pot of, pot of money that the defendant never even received. That's the, that's the interpretation that my learned friend needs to put on this, that once the defendant has obtained and retained some money, somebody's money, by fraud, that is a trigger for an obligation in equity to pay compound interest on something else, some other pot of money that they never had. <coughs> so as, I, as I showed you, that's why I took you through the pleadings, <coughs> show you that those are the contours of this case, that's the nature of this claim. And I say that, I say two things. <coughs> One is that actually, when you spell it out like that, um, you spell out the, the full import of my, my learned friend's submission, that obtaining and retaining pot of money A from person A gives rise to an obligation to account for compound interest on pot of money B, which you never had. Um, that doesn't make any sense. It, it's very difficult to understand what the rationale is, what the thinking is behind that proposition. But we don't need to worry too much about that because it's just not what the Privy Council said. What, what they're talking about here is the situation that was in front of them, actually, which is a situation in which the claimant is trying to recover with interest some money that the defendant obtained and retained by fraud. That's what's being said. So that, those are my submissions on Johnson. Um, I also want to show you more recent authority than the Kuwait um, oil case uh, which is Authorities Bundle 12. So that, that may be Volume 2. No, it's still, still Volume 1. Oh, it's Bundle 1. Very sorry. Um, my learned friend took you to this as well, um, so I, I don't need to go through the foothills on it. But if we can just go to page 386, which again, this, this is the passage that my learned friend took you to. Um, and you can see immediately above paragraph 210 that the court has quoted from Lord Brandon's formulation as to the circumstances in which equity will award compound interest. And then um, it says that in such a case, the award of compound interest is made on a basis that the trust, a trustee misapplying monies for his own benefit and a person obtaining or retaining money by fraud who is to be similarly treated. So that's, it. that's important. He's drawing an analogy between the situation of a fiduciary and the person who has obtained and retained money by fraud. Both of those people should be obliged either to account in full for the benefit that he, they have unjustly derived or in lieu of such account to pay compound interest when the circumstances justify an award on that basis. So again, you can see that, that compound interest is being in lieu of accounting for the actual profits that the defendant has made with the money. Um, and that's exactly the point that I'm making about the rationale um, for the fraud limb. The point I'm making is that the rationale is the same as the rationale for the fiduciary limb. Now, uh, and you can see, um, the court goes on to say, the rationale is historically and essentially that of restitution, i.e. a fiduciary, I insert brackets, or a fraudster who has obtained the claimant's money, should not be permitted to make a profit from his trust, I insert brackets, or fraud. Um, then he goes on, and this is the part that my learned friend placed reliance on, um, the quotation from Lord Denning um, in Wallerstein, um, where it says, yes, the rationale is essentially that of restitution, but it can also be compensation. Um, 
and uh, the court notes that uh, Lord Justices Buckley and Scarman didn't make that point in Wallace Diner, um, but they say that doesn't matter because um, it is nonetheless a justification for the award of compound interest in those circumstances. Um, and so th that, that was the point that my learned friend made, that he said that uh, I'm wrong to say that the fraud limb is being justified by a kind of accounting logic, a kind of restitutionary logic. Um, but that doesn't help him um, for two reasons. The first reason is that this justification that is being given here, the compensatory one, applies equally to both of the fraud and the fiduciary limbs. And that's exactly the point that we are trying to make on our side of the court about this case, that it shows that the two limbs have the same rationale. Because in both cases, equity is reacting to a situation in which a trustee, or someone who can be treated as a trustee, has withheld or misapplied the claimant's money. It doesn't matter that sometimes what the award of compound interest is, is doing there is disgorging profits. And in other cases, what it's doing is compensating the beneficiary for what the beneficiary might have done with, with the beneficiary's money, what the claimant might have done with his own money if the defendant hadn't been holding it. Um, in both cases, that the trustee is being held to account for the consequences that the trustee or the fraudster has been holding the claimant's money. Um, so that's, that's the first reason why the compensatory rationale where it applies doesn't help. But the other point, the other reason it, he, he can't pray this in aid, is that in this case, the interest that the claimants are claiming is not compensatory, as I said right at the outset of my submissions. The whole reason why they need to claim in equity rather than under sempra it's not just because they're, they're not able to plead and prove their loss of use of money. It's not some difficulty in finding the records. It's a, this is the case where we know they didn't suffer any loss, loss of use of money because they weren't trading. So this claim is an example of disgorgement. And I'll come back to the significance of that shortly. Um, well, you'd probably rely also, wouldn't you, on what said in paragraph 211 about the, the equitable jurisdiction being a necessary adjunct of the claimant's substantive right to restitution. Yes. And that ties in with the point you're making. So, sorry, my lord. That ties in with the point you're making. That, that I'm making, yes, that's right. I mean, the, that was what my, my learned friend set up at, at the beginning, and I've not gone over it again, but the, the reason the court was doing this was that it was concerned about whether... Um, whether in Kuwaiti law um, there was also a right to compound interest. And um, what the court was saying was that there, there is an article, that the judge of first instance had found that there is an article in the Kuwaiti civil code that uh, allows for restitutionary um, awards. And so the court is saying that's fundamentally what's happening here. And so it's the same. Um, but my, my learned friend says that all, all this is wrong. Um, and he says that you can obtain compound um, interest in equity, even from a fraudster, uh, sorry, not, not from a fraudster, from a fraudster, even in circumstances where the fraudster has no duty to account. Um, and he, he gives the example in his skeleton, um, it, it's a supplemental skeleton at, at paragraph 31, of a claimant who is fraudulently induced to enter into a contract. And he says that the claimant can seek damages, um, even if the claimant doesn't rescind the contract, under which money was paid to the defendant. And he says that um, that is not a situation in which the defendant is holding money belonging to a claimant because the money passed under a valid contract um, that has not been rescinded, even though there's a claim for deceit and the contract could have been avoided. It hasn't been. Um, and um, so he, he uses that situation as a, as a counterexample to our interpretation of what this, what this limb is about. Um, in my submission, that raises an interesting question of law about a set of facts that are very different um, from the one that we're dealing with here. Um, because in the circumstances that he's describing, in my submission, there's a very good argument, right, that the claimant's money was not obtained by fraud. Because uh, as he says um, in that paragraph of his skeleton, the, the money is obtained under a valid contract, um, which is not being um, uh, rescinded. 
So on that basis, if, that, if a claimant wanted to um, claim compound interest, it would simply have to plead and prove loss of use of money under SEMPRA. Um, there's no problem with that. Um, as, as far as I'm aware, um, that question, you know, of what would happen in, in that hypothetical scenario, um, has not been argued and decided in the authorities. Um, but I should say that, uh, and I've got to go there now to look at it in a bit more detail, um, that it was common ground in the Mann case um, that actually has that fact pattern. And it was common ground that compound interest could be awarded in equity in those circumstances. Um, but I don't need to invite you to decide uh, that the judge in that case was wrong, um, because that issue just does not arise on the facts of our case at all. And I want to show you why. In, in fact, on the contrary, the decision in man is actually clear in my favor um, that in compound interest cannot be claimed um, in the circumstances of this case. So I, I just want to show that to you. So that's authorities bundle tab 16. And it starts at paragraph 450. And although my learned friend did go through this, I do need to say a little bit more about the facts um, than he did, just to just to understand how the discussion about interest actually arose. Um, We're going to man now, are we? Man, that's 16. right. That's 16, right. Page 450 is where it starts. <coughs> so the facts of that case were that a truck company called Man bought another truck company, which was called ERF, from a third truck country company, uh, which was called Western Star. But Western Star sold ERF to MAN. <coughs> um, Western Star itself was later merged into the defendant, which was Freightliner. Um, and so um, MAN then sued Freightliner as a successor in title to Western Star um, on the basis that ERF's accounts were fraudulent. Um, so that's the, that's the nature of, of the claim. Um, if we could go to page 472. Four seven two. Four seven two. You can see at the beginning of paragraph sixty six um, that Man's MN, that's Man's case, um, was that it was induced to purchase ERF by false representations. And I don't need to worry too much about the rest of the detail. So, say that over the page at the back end of that um, paragraph. I just see what they sought to recover by way of damages. They, they sought to recover by way of damages for deceit the whole amount that they paid for ERF. So that's one thing. Where are you? Together with the amount that it had spent. Where are you? Top of page 473. Oh, I'm sorry. We're on page 473, right at the top. Um, uh, so, yes, it, it, it's claiming damages for... What it, what, what it paid to acquire ERF, um, so that's the money that it paid to Western Star, but in addition, it also claimed the amount that they'd spent to keep ERF going until a reorganization that happened down the road, uh, less the value of ERF as a, as a going concern. And you can see that the total amount claimed was 350 million pounds. Let's try and remember that sum. Um, now, the quantum issues were actually not resolved at this trial um, by agreement between all concerned. Um, but th there was um, a discussion of interest. And that we pick up at page 545, which is where my learned friend took you. And you can see at paragraph 318, man seeks an award of compound interest um, on that part of its damages that represents the original purchase price and the value of the intercompany loan which it repaid um, under the share purchase agreement. Um, and then it says that in light of, uh, of La Pintada and Westdeutsche and Black and Davies, it was common ground that the court has power in the exercise of its equitable jurisdiction to award compound interest on damages for deceit only in cases where money has been obtained and retained by fraud. The key sentence is the next one in paragraph 319. 
where the judge says, on the face of it, Western Star did obtain and retain as a result of the fraud both the purchase price and the value of the intercompany loan, um, which is discharged pursuant to the share purchase agreement, which together amounted to about £86 million. Pounds. So, two points to make. The first is that nobody seems to have argued the point that I canvassed before, which would be interesting in another case, actually it would have been interesting in man, about whether, um, given that this money was passing under a valid contract, perhaps this money wasn't actually obtained by fraud. Um, but it's fair to say that the judge did not regard that as an obstacle um, in respect of this money. But the important thing, and the reason why this whole interesting um, rabbit hole that my learned friend has, has raised doesn't help, is that the compound interest was limited to the sums, and everyone seems to have accepted this, was limited to the sums that were actually paid by the claimants to Western Star. So that's only the 86 million pounds and not the 350 million pounds, not the, not the total sum, but um, including all of the other uh, damages that were claimed um, from you know, the running of, of ERF. And that just goes back to what I said before about Johnson, really. What this illustrates is that if the, even if the claimants are right in what they say about a fraudulent inducement case, then it just doesn't help them because their, their claim for damages here all falls into the category of the 350 million and none of it into the category of the 86 million because they don't allege that they paid anything to us. That the money that they're claiming interest on is not said to be money that we obtained and retained by fraud. It's money that someone it's money that they lost when they largely when they purchased monitors and notebooks from people who have nothing to do with the cartel. They're just people who bought panels and then made monitors and then sold them and on in the market and further down the supply chain. In some cases, many steps down the supply chain. That's the nature of the claim. It, this is not a case in which they are claiming interest on money that we received. So that, that just goes back to where I started. So man is actually, actually an illustration um, of what we are saying um, on our side of the court, which is that you can only claim compound interest in equity um, under the fraud limb on money that you're actually recovering from someone who obtained and retained that money by fraud. So you say they fail on the facts? Sorry, they... You say they fail on the facts? Uh, they fail before you get to the facts. They, they, they fail at the pleadings. Um, so, Perhaps, but yeah. the point is, I mean, we, we've been swimming in and out of some quite difficult concepts of law. Yes. As I have noted it, you, only, you say you only get anywhere close to the Brandon fraud limb yeah. um, once you've got a position on the facts where there is money that is paid from A to B and held by B when it should have been repaid to A. That's, That's the basic fact pattern that, that you that, need that to get exactly anywhere close to it. And you say they fail at that. My lady, that is exactly point. right. That, that's right. So this, and this is my first point. This is under the heading of the claimant's money point. I, I'm yeah, yeah. coming to the by fraud point. Yeah, yeah. Um, but th th this is just my respondent's notice point. Yes. Um, but it's a complete answer to the claim. Um, uh, my, my learned friend um, also said in his skeleton argument that he, he didn't develop it um, orally. I don't know whether it's of interest, but. He said that um, the error in our analysis can be seen uh, by the fact that a, a dishonest assistant can be held liable um, to pay compound interest. Um, but that particular development in the law is um, of, of no assistance to the claimants. And we can see why, actually, just by looking at, at their skeleton argument, um, paragraph 55. in the core bundle, tab 5, page 59. And my friend is discussing the FM Capital Partners Merino case. Um, and he quotes from Mrs. Justice Cockerell, 
who said that the balance of authority favours the view that an award of compound interest can be made against the dishonest assistant, who is not themselves a fiduciary, um, because that seems to be logical, given that the basis of the assistant's liability is accessory, and that it is predicated on dishonesty, and that as far as the principal amount of the remedy is concerned, his liability is coextensive with that of the um, fiduciary or trustee. Um, so the, the, the key point there is that that particular extension of the law is being made by reference to the fact that the assistant, the dishonest assistant, is an accessory um, to the um, to the trustee. And so it's under the fiduciary limb, not under the fraudster limb. Um, but uh, be because the assistant is has coextensive liability in relation to the principal, um, so it is said it is logical um, that this should also um, extend to the interest. Actually, the liability of the dishonest assister is not necessarily coextensive with that of the fiduciary, because the fiduciary Required to account for the profits which he has made. That's right. But the dishonest assister is only liable for the profits which, to account for the profits which he has made, and not those which the fiduciary has made. Your lordship is, is absolutely right, and it, it, it seems that when forced to make a choice as to whether to draw the analogy with the, the principal sum of money belonging to the claimant and say that whatever goes for that goes for the interest or to draw the analogy with the profits made um, from retaining um, that sum. Uh, Mr. Justice Cockerell plumped for the former rather than the latter. But that doesn't help us with this case, um, which is about the fraud limb, um, and where this reasoning just doesn't apply at all. Um, so we do say that that particular extension of the law um, just doesn't help. And so that's, that's why we say that, that this court was right in Black and Davies. And uh, although um, our lady, lady Justice Whipple is right that, that we have, to return to my little friend's um, metaphor, we have swum in some deep waters um, of law and we've dealt with some tricky concepts. Um, in some ways, we don't really need to because this court has already done it before. They've done the work, they've done the swimming, they've read all the cases, and they have given us the answer in paragraph 87. Black and Davies. And as I said before, if paragraph 87 is right, then my learned friend is wrong. And we say it is. Um, there is one further reason um, why we say it, it can't be right that a cartel damages claim um, without an allegation that um, the defendants held the claimant's money warrants the award of interest um, in the absence of a loss of use of money. And, and that is that relief for cartel damages claims, and actually for all non-proprietary torts, is limited to compensation for loss. And restitutionary or gains-based remedies are precluded um, by this court's decision in Devonish. Um, and if I could just show you that. Um, so that's in the authorities bundle, at tab 20. Um, I'm getting towards the back end. Page 746. see from the head note um, that this was a, another cartel damages claim. Um, and I, I should just say, but my learned friend um, read from Britned, um, in, in which Mr. Justice Marcus Smith uh, said that that was the first claim for damages under Article 101 to go to trial. I, th I think if, if that's what he said, it's, it's actually not even the first one that he gave judgment in, um, because the Sainsbury's Mastercard case was another, it just it wasn't a cartel damages claim another claim under Article 101. But that, that's a small point. The, the bigger point is that al although that was the first cartel damages claim to go to trial, um, people in this branch of the law have been uh, doing this for a while now, and there have been lots of strikeouts and jurisdiction challenges and, um, uh, and requests for further information and pleadings and um, uh, evidence exchanged. And, and all, there's been a lot of litigation happening. Um, uh, in this field, even if not many of the cases have gone to judgment. There has now been another one um, in, in the 
tracks cartel. Um, but it's, it's certainly not true that cartel damages claims are a novel form of litigation or, um, or not something that has, uh, has happened a lot. Um, so where I'd be in, I'd be in some trouble. Um, so as I say, th th this was a cartel damages claim relating to the vitamins cartel. Um, the claimants uh, sued for damages, but in addition to suing for damages, they sued for restitutionary awards and even an account of profits. And the question in this case was whether they could do that. Um, and the Court of Appeals decision starts at page 791 in the bundle. And if we could just, this is Lady Justice Arden's um, decision. And it's paragraph two. She says that this appeal involves a fundamental issue for the purposes of the law of tort, which may be summarized as follows. The aim of the law of tort is to compensate for loss suffered. The courts have exceptionally also awarded damages, user damages, um, by reference to the fair value of a right of which the defendant has wrongly deprived the claimant. And these awards have been made even if the claimant would not himself have sought to use that right and so incurred no loss. However, there is no question in this case of Devonish, the claimant, having been deprived of a proprietary right, that is, a right arising from property to which such awards were formerly confined. Devonish relies on the, what was then the recent case of um, Attorney General and Blake, in which a remedy of the type that it seeks in this case was awarded for breach of contract not involving the deprivation of any property. Uh, Devonish contends that compensatory damages will not be an adequate remedy. The defendants contend that this court cannot apply the principle established in Blake um, to a purely personal tortious claim, and in particular that this court is precluded um, by precedent, namely the decisions in Wass and Halifax from holding otherwise. The defendants accept that a restitution reward could be made for a proprietary tort, and by proprietary, Lady Justice Arden means a tort for which a claimant entitled to property or a property right um, is entitled to sue for interference on the basis discussed by Lord Nichols in Blake's case. Thus, the expression includes trespass to land or wrongful interference with goods. It's not necessary to be more precise than this. The only further point to be noted is that Devonish's claim is not on any basis a proprietary claim. The defendants also contend that compensatory damages will be an adequate remedy I will call the issue, summarised above, the Blake issue. Going on to paragraph four, you can see she gives the conclusion, and I'm not going to go through all the reasoning because it doesn't really matter for our purposes. But her conclusion on the Blake issue is this. The overall holding in Blake's case is that the law on remedies for interference with property, damages in lieu of injunction, damages for breach of fiduciary duty, and breach of contract should be coherent and the same remedies should be available in the same circumstances, even if the course of action is different. On that basis, a restitutionary reward is available in tort unless it is precluded by the West case or the Halifax case. In my judgment, it is precluded by the West case. And then she goes on to say that if she's wrong, um, she wouldn't have awarded it anyway. Um, Lord Justice Longmore disagreed, um, but if we go to page 836, We get the conclusion of Lord Justice Tucky's um, ruling, which was the same. He says, I too would dismiss this appeal. Devonish is entitled to be compensated for any loss it has suffered as a result of the cartel, no more and no less. What is it that Lord Justice Longmore disagreed about? Because he dismisses the appeal as well, and the his reasoning seems to be quite similar. I uh, yes, I, I think he, he concluded that um, Wass uh, was not, um, did not rule out these types, this type of relief well, for non proprietary tort claims. But, but he's still not, he's still not awarding any restitutionary no, remedy. No, I think because that's right. Because essentially he thinks there's no need to. Yeah, so that's, is, is, is that, um, that's right. Is that Lady Justice Arden's alternative? Why that, that's right. And Lord Justice Longmore was approved in Sainsbury's, yeah. as you tell us in your skeleton, anyway. Uh, sorry, uh, the thing that was approved in Saints. So what we said in Saint in Saints. Sorry, 
what we said in the skeleton argument about Sainsbury's is that Sainsbury's also says that, um, uh, that claims for cartel breach of Article 101 are compensatory. Um, and that's the, that's the limit of it. So they, they approve um, passages in Law Justice Normal and Law Justice Tucky saying that, if I remember rightly, um, you can't have a restitutionary award no. in a cartel damages claim because that would be just transferring money from one undeserving person to another. The, 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 that's right. So they, the, they, they uphold what's called the passing on defence, yes. um, which precludes you from claiming in respect of losses that have been passed on to, to someone else. Yes, the point, the point being damages are compensatory. Exactly. It's a compensatory principle. That's exactly right. Um, okay. So th we say that that is another problem with the claimant's case on this point, because where, where a claimant can only say that they've suffered a personal wrong, and cannot say that the defendant has interfered with their property, um, the law will compensate the claimant, um, but no more. Um, and, and so we say that that is the fundamental flaw with this claim for compound interest, because as I said at the very beginning, it is um, non-compensatory. Um, so that, th those are my submissions on the, the claimant's money point. Um, so we say that um, that point on its own is enough to dispose of the appeal. Um, but we have another equally good point, um, which is the by fraud point, um, uh, which is the point that was made by the judge. And so I just want to show you a bit more of the judge's reasoning on it. Um, so that's in the core bundle, tab 10, page 114. see at the bottom of the page, right at the bottom, the judge says that he asked my learned friend what conduct the claimants relied on as establishing um, the equitable fraud, and that in answer, my learned friend accepted that the mere operation of a cartel uh, would not in and of itself be enough, and what tipped the scales was the element of deliberate concealment. Now obviously that, that's now changed, um, and on appeal, my learned friend does say um, that mere operation of the cartel is enough. Um, and I will come on to deal with that. But I just wanted to show you that because that sets up the, the nature of the judge's reasoning um, that follows. So if we, if we just look at paragraph 37, you, you can see the judge therefore framed the issue as being um, whether the allegation of deliberate concealment as pleaded um, was sufficient to engage equity's jurisdiction within Lord Brandon's first limb. Um, so that was, uh, that was the issue. And then, as my learned friend showed you in paragraph 38, um, he assumed, the judge assumed without deciding, that conduct which involves deliberate concealment of a wrong may, in appropriate circumstances, be capable of being characterized as equitable fraud. Um, but he said that that seems most likely where the concealment itself is a breach of duty. In paragraph 39, um, but he said that's just the beginning of the analysis, because even if that's right and deliberate concealment can be characterized as equitable, Fraud. It can't be enough for a party merely to point to some conduct which might fall within the definition of equitable fraud. Um, so much is clear from Black and Davies. What has to be established is that money has been obtained and retained by fraud. Paragraph 40. This must mean that the fraud must be the cause of action, or at least an element of the cause of action, and in any event that it is the fraud which has caused the money to be obtained and retained. Paragraph 41, um, applying that analysis, that test, the contention fails at, at multiple levels. The allegation of deliberate concealment is not itself the cause of action, nor is it even alleged to be part of the cause of action, appearing at that stage only in the reply for a different purpose. Of course, now it also appears in the draft to be re, -re amended particulars of claim, um, but, but still, uh, only as part of the plea in relation to interest, and not as part of the plea um, establishing um, the, the principal liability. Um, yes, it, it says, in any event, the deliberate concealment is not alleged to have caused um, my clients to obtain and retain the fund for their own benefit, 
They might or might not have benefited from the receipt of the monies, um, but that's not something that would be explored on the pleaded case. Um, and the only contention in the answers uh, to the request for information is that the concealment prevented the pursuit of damages. Um, and that's clearly not enough. Um, so ultimately, the judge said in paragraph 41, the contention fails for similar reasons to those in Black and Davies, namely that it's not enough merely to contend that the wrong caused the claimants to lose money. Um, in paragraph 42, I'd also like to just note the last couple of sentences um, where the context is that the judge has just quoted from um, Lord Brown Wilkinson in Westdeutsche um, when he warned against usurping the function of parliament by expanding the, the um, equitable rules for the award of compound interest. And then the judge noted the point that my, my learned friend has made, which is that he's not seeking here to add a third category. Um, but he said that uh, Lord Brown Wilkinson's rejection of a more general extension of the equitable jurisdiction stands also as a warning against a loose approach to the categories. Should it be enough to allege deliberate concealment of a wrong, leading to a delay in recovering damages, this would result in cartel damages cases, as well as many other common law claims, in the very usurpation of parliament, which he was at pains to avoid. Um, and in my submission, that is absolutely right. If in any case, in any tort claim, um, you could say, simply by, by virtue of there being deliberate concealment, that was enough to get you um, into uh, the jurisdiction in equity to award compound interest then that, that would be very surprising indeed. I think we can be confident that Lord Brandon would have been surprised by that interpretation um, of what he said in La Pintada. It's a very odd form of words to have used um, if Lord Brandon had in mind, um, or any of the previous people who used that, that formulation, um, Privy Council in um, Johnson or the Law Commission. Um, if, if any of them thought that they were saying that in any case where you've got deliberate concealment of a wrong, um, that brings you into uh, the equitable jurisdiction, then that wouldn't have been a narrow category. That would have been lots of cases. Um, so in a nutshell, the, the judge's conclusion was that if you want to rely on the fraud limb, um, sorry, I should also say that at the, at the second hearing that we had, the consequentials hearing, the judge did also address the new pleadings. And my learned friend has already shown you that. It was paragraph eight. Um, on page 161 of the bundle, so I don't think we need to go back there. But basically, what he said was that the new pleadings don't really add anything um, to the old pleadings. Um, so in, in a nutshell, the, the judge's conclusion was that if you want to rely on the fraud limb, you need to have a claim in fraud, or at least a claim for which one element is fraud. It's not enough to say that there is a fraud somewhere lurking in the background of a breach of contract claim, um, for example. Um, and we say that is obviously right. When Lord Brandon referred to situations in which money had been obtained by fraud, he was obviously talking about that fraud that is action. Um, and that is also clear from the Privy Council's earlier decision in Johnson. Um, you remember we saw earlier the reference to the statement, money obtained by fraud and retained by fraud can be recovered with interest. So the Privy Council was talking about an action for recovery of the monies what kind of action? It was obviously talking about an action in fraud. Um, in fact, that, that was the whole point of that case. Right? That, that case had been pleaded initially in fraud and in mistake, but only the mistake part of the, cl the claim was pursued because that was conceded, and they just they didn't pursue the fraud limb of the claim. Um, and, and that was the reason why interest was not awarded, um, uh, or rather why the award of interest was quashed by the Privy Council on appeal in that case. Um, because the only cause of action that was actually pursued at trial was the cause of action for recovery of money by mistake, not recovery of money um, in fraud. Um, and so we say that that really is a, a very far cry from the case that the claimants um, want to advance, um, certainly the one they want to advance below, but they still maintain in the alternative, and this is the second ground on appeal, which is purely based on deliberate concealment of a non-fraudulent tort. If deliberate concealment of a non-fraudulent tort was sufficient to engage the jurisdiction, then the law reports um, would be littered with cases of it. Um, but 
They're not. My learned friend hasn't found a single case um, in which compound interest has been awarded in equity um, for a non-fraudulent tort. Ever. Um, and so the truth is that, as the judge said, what my learned friend has in mind would be a massive expansion of the jurisdiction um, to award interest in equity. And that would be to usurp the role of parliament in practice. So that's the first part of my submissions on the by fraud point, which really just tracks what the judge said in the judgment. I now also need to deal with um, round one, um, which, as I said before, was my learned friend's um, way of getting around the judgment to say, actually, the cartel itself, the cause of action for breach of statutory duty, for breach of Article 101, is a claim in fraud. Um, I, I just note in passing that sometimes when a learned friend tries to say, or seems to be saying, that he's not talking about all cartel damages case, cases, but rather just this one. And uh, uh, I just want to make the point by reference to what you've seen in the pleadings, that there's nothing special about this one. No, nothing has been pleaded about this one that takes it outside of every cartel damages case. But all that's been pleaded is that it was a case of serious wrongdoing, um, which is true of every cartel, um, by definition. Any cartel is, is serious wrongdoing. Um, and also that it was secret, um, which is also um, obviously true uh, of every cartel. Um, and yet, as we shall see, the House of Lords has explained um, in Norris and in Goldshield um, that secret cartels are not even actionable not only are they not um, fraud, they're not even actionable at common law or in equity in the absence of aggravating features like fraud, or in particular, like positive lies that are told to your customers um, uh, about the way in which prices have been formed or about competition or about something. You need positive deception um, in, order for, um, in order for there to be something actionable um, there. Um, you don't, do you? I mean, your the case against you doesn't um, depend on that. No, my Lord, sorry? I'm just not sure why you say, say I mean, I'll share what the House of Lords said, but I'm um, not sure why you say that the cartel is not even actionable without aggregating features. Oh, I, I'm very sorry. Because I, I, it only is under Article Of course it is, my Lord. Uh, it, it's actionable as a breach of statutory duty. Sorry, what, what I meant to say is it's not actionable in equity. Um, and so, but for the, the, the fact that there is a statutory prohibition of cartel conduct, which of course you can pursue a, a claim for damages for compensation, absolutely. Um, but what, what the House of Lords said in Norris was that before that, it wasn't even actionable. So the, the courts of common law and, and equity, um, and I'll show you that they, they did refer to equity, um, did let, not regard let, let, cartel. Let's just have a look at that paragraph from Norris again. Yes. Yeah, well, actually, we need to take Norris um, a couple of steps back. Um, so it, the, the key, so Norris is at authorities bond at 18. Um, <coughs> and my, my learned friend is quite right that the context was the application to extradite Mr. Norris. Um, and that this was refused on the basis that cartel behavior could not be characterized as a criminal conspiracy to defraud. So that, that is the ratio, the outcome. Um, but although it is a, um, in the criminal context, the learned friend was wrong to say that the, the court did not consider um, the, the question of whether it was actionable in equity. Um, because the, he, he took you to paragraph 17, and I'm gonna come back to paragraph 17. Um, that's on page 709. But that comes as the conclusion from the analysis um, by the committee of a series of older cases um, in the common law and equitable courts um, that considered cartel conduct um, at a time before it was prohibited by statute. And if I can just show you one of those, and, and these collectively provide the basis for the conclusion that's given in paragraph 17. If I can just show you one of those, it's paragraph 10. This was the, the case of Jones and Knorr. What was said about that case is that- Page, what page? I'm sorry, it's page 707. Yes. 
What's said is that all parties in that case were invited to tender for the supply of stone to a public authority. Those four parties made a collusive agreement by which one party was to buy the stone from the other three and then submit the lowest tender. And then two parties were to submit the higher tender. And then the fourth party was to submit no tender. And House of Lords notes that there is nothing in the report to suggest the public authority knew of this agreement and every reason to suppose that it did not. And that seems fairly obvious given that they're going to the trouble to agree on, on what tenders each party should um, be submitting. The whole point of doing that um, is to make the defendant think that it's conducting a proper tender process. Now the matter became, came before the court when the defendant in breach of the agreement, as in, in breach of the cartel agreement, um, submitted a tender which was accepted by the, um, by the authority. And the party which was meant to supply under the cartel agreement, sorry, uh, under that agreement, um, brought proceedings to restrain performance. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very sorry. The party which was to supply under the cartel agreement, so the the party that it had been agreed should have been the winner um, of the tender um, uh, brought an action to restrain performance by the cartelist who had broken ranks. And that action to enforce the cartel agreement succeeded. And Vice Chancellor Bacon um, considered that the plaintiff's case was very honest, that's the way he put it. Um, then what, what follows is important. He says that it was submitted um, by the defendants, the defendant cartelists, that the plaintiff cartelists could not obtain equitable relief. In other words, had come to the court without clean hands because the arrangement was a device to compel the authority under the fiction of a public competition to accept tenders not representing the real market price of the commodity. So that was the submission that was made. But that submission was rejected by the Vice-Chancellor, um, who found that the agreement was, the cartel agreement, was perfectly lawful and contained nothing illegal and not deserving to be characterized as a conspiracy. Seems astonishing to modern eyes. It, it, it seems astonishing now, um, yeah. my lords. But actually, if you read through all of these paragraphs, and I'm, I'm not going to take you through all of them because there isn't, there isn't much point, um, until Parliament came along um, and prohibited cartel behavior, th this was the attitude of the courts of common law and equity. Both. Um, so th the right way to think about it is that, of course, cartel behavior um, is serious wrongdoing. Absolutely. Um, but it's serious wrongdoing contrary to a, to a statute. It's not serious wrongdoing contrary to any principle at, at common law um, or equity um, on its own. Obviously, once Parliament has um, passed legislation that prohibits it, that then provides a footing for the common law to come in and provide a remedy, um, which is the tort of the common law tort of breach of statutory duty. Um, and so claimants can obtain compensation um, for the harm that follows from this breach of a, of a public norm, of a statutory norm. Um, but there, there is no principle of law that says that equity intervenes to provide relief in the form of compound interest just because you've deliberately breached a statute. So it's, however wide the concept of equitable fraud might be, I should pause there. My, my learned friend says equitable fraud. I mean, what Lord Brandon says is fraud, and it seems likely that what he means by that is actual fraud, because he's distinguishing it from breach of fiduciary duty. And breach of fiduciary duty is the main category of equitable fraud that you see in the cases, um, aside from actual fraud. Um, but e even, if, even if we take my learned friend's case at its highest and say, well, any, any kind of equitable fraud will do, that can't mean anything more than what is actionable in equity. And that's the, that's the force of these cases, is that cartel conduct is not actionable in equity. It is prohibited by statute, 
And by virtue of having been prohibited by statute, it is actionable in the common law tort of breach of statutory duty. And that's all. So that's, that's the, con the, the context for paragraph 17. Um, we, and you can see that from the first sentence of paragraph 17, which is that the effect of these authorities may be succinctly summarized, that the common law recognized an agreement in restraint of trade might be unreasonable in the public interest, and in such cases, an agreement in restraint of trade um, might be uh, void or would be void and unenforceable. Um, but unless there were aggravating features such as fraud <coughs> or misrepresentation or violence or intimidation or inducement of a breach of contract, such agreements were not actionable, that's the word that is being used, or indictable, which is, of course, the important point for, that, for the outcome of that case. Um, so that's why we say a cartel on its own even a secret cartel, um, like the secret agreement in um, Jones and Knorr, is not actionable in equity. Um, I also want to look at Gold Shield because um, my learned friend's submissions on that, um, I, I think, confused what the issue in the case was. Um, Gold Shield was decided on the same day um, by uh, the House of Lords. Um, and obviously, it would be surprising if it was saying something different um, from what we've just seen. Um, well, it's by the same constitution, and it's argued immediately after. That, that, that's right. And, it's, and, and it adopts the analysis um, from the, the Norris case. Um, but if I can just show you, um, uh, yes, that, that was an application to quash an indictment on the ground that it did not disclose an offense against a criminal law. So it is another case in the criminal context. I just want to go to paragraphs 11 um, to 15, because I, th I think this is where um, my learned friend fell into error. And so that's on page 743. So picking it up, um, perhaps, perhaps I should just say what the error is. Um, I, I think what my learned friend was saying is that this was a case in which the appellants quibble so that the, the reason for uh, applying to quash the indictment was that it had only been alleged that they were doing price fixing, whereas it should have been alleged that they had an agreement to fix prices. And that, that doesn't make any sense, if that is what he was saying, because price fixing is obviously an, an agreement. And, and you'll see that when I come on. The, the distinction was actually, the complaint was that all that they'd been indicted with was an agreement to fix prices. Whereas what they should have been indicted with was an agreement to do the extra things, to do the aggravating features. So an agreement to tell positive lies, an agreement to mislead the NHS. That's what they should have been indicted with, because that's what, following Norris, that's what you need in order to establish a conspiracy to defraud. Um, and so you, you'll see that in these paragraphs. So if we look at paragraph 11, um, as Lord Justice Moses pointed out, there's no dispute between the parties as to the meaning of conspiracy to defraud. Um, for present purposes, it's sufficient to refer to the definition from uh, Wai Yutsang that the conspirators have dishonestly agreed to bring about a state of affairs which they realize will or may deceive the victim into acting or failing to act, and that he will suffer economic loss or his economic interests will be put at risk. It hardly needs to be said that while the subsequent actions of conspirators may be cogent evidence on the content of their agreement, the actus reus uh, is the original reaching of the agreement. And the focus of the court trying conspiracy case has to be on the content of the agreement and the contemplation of the parties when it was made. It may be seen from the summaries of the prose prosecution case, which we have quoted, that its essence, as in the essence of the prosecution case, is that price fixing, when accompanied by secretive and misleading behavior of the kind alleged, is dishonest by the standards of ordinary citizens and sufficient without more to found a prosecution for conspiracy to defraud. The contrary submissions advanced by counsel for the appellants is that price fixing agreements, which he describes as cartel behavior, so it's, it's being accepted that they are agreements, are not in themselves criminal, even if made secretly and with an element of deception which may be widely regarded as dishonest. Conspiracy to defraud would require proof of agreement to make 
false or misleading statements or other actively fraudulent behavior. So that's the argument that was being made by the appellants. It wasn't that there was no agreement. They accepted that price fixing agreements are agreements. The point was that you had to have an agreement to make false or misleading statements or actively fraudulent behavior. Passive secrecy um, won't do, even if people might regard passive secrecy as dishonest. Um, so then uh, the prosecution case was accepted by Mr. Justice Pitchford, um, who refused uh, the um, appellant's applications that he should quash. And then the Court of Appeal upheld the judge's rulings. Um, in his submissions to them, which he repeated before the House, Mr. Panic did not assert on behalf of the appellants a right to practice positive deceptions, positive deceptions. He submitted that mere entry into a secret cartel was not criminal and was to be distinguished from positive action, such as deceptive misrepresentation. The court rejected that argument, um, with Lord Justice Moses saying um, what he does there, that no such distinction can be made. Paragraph 15. The appellate committee considered these arguments, as in the arguments that Mr. Panic put um, in, uh, in Gold Shield, considered those arguments in Norris and came to the conclusion that the appellant's submission in that case, the relevant part of which largely mirrors that which was advanced on behalf of the appellants in the present appeal, was correct. Lord, Just Sorry, Lord Bingham, giving the opinion of the committee, stated at paragraph 17, um, and we've already seen that, um, unless there are aggravating features such as fraud, misrepresentation, violence, etc., such agreements, no question about there being an agreement, were not actionable or indictable. We refer to that opinion, the content of which we need not repeat, for the detailed reasons um, on which the committee based its conclusion. Um, so that's, that's what the issue was. And that's the context for paragraph 18. Um, and what the, what the court says, um, the committee says in paragraph 18, is that the voluminous material in the prosecution case statement contains within it quite sufficient notice of aggravating elements. Now, what aggravating elements? Aggravating elements consisting of allegations of lies and positive deception. So exactly what Mr. Panic, um, Lord Panic, uh, said was needed. Um, so the appellants could not possibly maintain that they were left without notice of the acts of this nature on which the prosecution could rely in putting forward a case of conspiracy um, on the basis of agreement to commit such acts, such acts, so that's an agreement to commit the lies and the positive deceptions. The difficulty which faces the prosecution is that although they could very well charge the appellants with cons conspiracy to fraud so based, they've not done so as the indictment stands. It's necessary that the particulars should make clear the case they must meet. It's readily apparent from the terms of the indictment and the summaries of the prosecution case statement, which we've quoted, that the thrust of the case, as so charged, is that of price fixing. And that case goes on the incorrect assumption that price fixing, when carried out in circumstances of secretive and deceptive behavior, is dishonest in itself and a sufficient um, basis for conspiracy to defraud. And so that is the assumption that has been held to be incorrect. The assumption that secretive and so the price fixing, so an agreement to fix prices um, when carried out in secretive and deceptive context is dishonest and a sufficient basis for conspiracy to defraud. So that the flaw was that the, the indictment did not isolate and charge any specific aggregating elements which could elevate the price fixing into an indictable conspiracy. And, and again, we've seen what those are. They've got to be positive lies, lies and positive deception. So I, I accept that if you had a case where there was a plea that there had been lies and positive deception in the context of a cartel, um, at least if those lies and positive deception, um, deception were directed at the, at the claimants, then a, a claimant bringing a claim like that might have an arguable claim for a um, conspiracy to defraud. Um, and so if, if, if there was, then that might be enough to give you the, the buy fraud limb. Um, still doesn't deal with the claimant's money point. But there is no allegation of that kind in, in this case. Um, you, you remember I sh showed you paragraph 68 to A. Uh, I don't know whether we want to go back there. 
to look at the allegation again. Um, but the allegation was put on the basis um, that there is the cartel, um, that's not enough. And that there was deliberate concealment, that's not enough. It's not a lie or a positive um, deception. And that there was serious and intentional wrongdoing, which is not enough either, that's every case. Um, the, the deliberate concealment um, is actually pleaded by reference to a specific recital in the commission decision, which is recital 302, which my learned friend showed you. Um, and perhaps we can go back to that. Um, so that's in supplemental bundle, tab one, page 80. Just before we go there, is it fair to say that Gold Shield means that um, although intentional price fixing is dishonest, that is not enough for conspiracy to defraud because you need the positive conduct in the form of lies or other, other deception? I, I don't think so, actually. So if, if we just look at paragraph 18. Um, it's the third last sentence. The, um, what it's saying there is that the indictment proceeds on the incorrect assumption that price fixing, when carried out in circumstances of secretive, deceptive behavior, is dishonest in itself. And, and, a sufficient and, and is a sufficient basis. basis. So it's in both those assumptions um, are incorrect. It's, it's certainly not a positive finding um, that it is dishonest. And again, that would be surprising given that the House of Lords in Norris um, went to the tr positively went to the trouble of quoting what Vice Chancellor Bacon said in Jones and North, which is the contrary, that it's very honest. Um, I mean, again, it, it sounds funny saying it now um, it, it, in light of you know, what is now um, thought of cartel behavior under statute. That, that, that is the way equity and the common law um, have always treated it, outside of the common law claim for breach of statutory duty. So you, you certainly don't have a claim for conspiracy to defraud. That's absolutely clear from paragraph 18 of, of Gold Shield and also from Norris, paragraph 17. But I, I don't think it's being, there's, there's nowhere in either of these decisions is there a statement from the House of Lords that price fixing is in and of itself dishonest. let alone that it's actionable in inequity or tantamount to fraud in any sense. Um, so if, if we could go to the supplemental bundle, tab one, on page 80. Recital 302 at the bottom of that page, page 80, is the recital that a learned friend's pleading relies on, and to be fair, his oral submissions were the same, for the um, deliberate concealment. And I, I make the point that there's not going to be any more of this at trial, um, because this is a follow-on damages claim, so this is, this is what they've got. Um, and what it says is that the anti-competitive object of the parties, so that's the topic that the Commission was actually addressing, um, it's not a requirement, it's not an element of a, of a finding of infringement that you deliberately conceal. It's just circumstantial evidence being relied on to support the finding of an anti-competitive object. That's confirmed by the fact that the parties took deliberate action to conceal their meetings and to avoid detection of the arrangements. So then the Commission goes on to say what it meant by that. What it meant by that is that the participant companies considered it important from the beginning to implement security measures to avoid consequences of antitrust law violation, and they made efforts to avoid being in possession of anti-competitive documents. And then there are some quotes. Do not talk about this meeting, not even to colleagues. Or requested everyone to take care of the security or confidentiality matters and to limit um, written communication. In addition, numerous documents bore the de express designation as confidential or extremely confidential. And, and instructed addressees not to distribute the documents, 
which further indicates the illegal purpose of the contacts and the intention to conceal them. And those precautionary measures clearly related to the risk of detection by antitrust authorities, as it was expressed many times, in particular with reference to the DRAM's investigation. Confidentiality was maintained within the participating companies as well, so within the companies as well as between them. Um, and uh, you can see there's a quote that says, location not specified here for confidentiality reasons, or location to be disclosed one day before the meeting in order to maintain confidentiality. Um, over the page, someone was maintaining strictly limited distribution for the summary um, of what was discussed at a particular uh, cartel meeting. Um, so th that is certainly secrecy. Um, the, the proceedings of the cartel were being kept secret and confidential, and steps were being taken, the commission found, to prevent it from leaking out into the world. But there's, there's nothing there um, that finds or even alleges or hints at um, lies or positive deception. Let alone so is this directly. right, Mr. Bishop, and the, the way the Competition Act works is that it makes all this decision admissible, which common law it wouldn't be. You can't question it, but the claimants can't add to it. Is, is that how it works? Uh, it, it's, it's a bit more complicated than, than that. Um, so, uh, as for it being binding on us, the decision, the operative part of the decision, which yes. is the bit that comes at the end, um, if we can, I'll give you the page. Um, page 117, properly so called in European law, that is the decision, um, the finding that there was an infringement. What comes before it, the reason I'm calling them recitals rather than paragraphs, yes. is that that's what they are. They're recitals right. that record the Commission's reasons for reaching this conclusion. Now, any findings of fact that are made in the course of reaching the conclusion that are essential to it, that are necessary for this finding in the operative part, are binding um, on us, um, but other findings uh, are not. Um, in general terms, um, a claimant is not stuck with um, what's in the commission decision. In general terms, a claimant can bring their own claim um, for damages uh, for, for breach of Article 101, even if there's never been a commission decision. Or they can allege that there were infringements going beyond those found by the commission, in general. In some circumstances, in, some, in, in the CAT, basically, before 2015, you couldn't. Um, in this case, the reason why I say it's not going to be anything else at trial is that in this case, it's a pure follow-on damages claim. Um, so they've chosen to bring their claim uh, in, in reliance exclusively on the commission decision to establish the infringement. And that's a common choice that people make for obvious reasons, I guess, that it, it, it saves quite a lot of time and money. Um, uh, so I hope that answers your Lordship's yes. question. Um, so th th that's why I say that, that this case, as it's been pleaded, um, is not within Norris and Goldchild, um, as in it. Sorry, put that put that rather poorly. Um, is not a conspiracy to defraud, um, and prior to uh, Article One Hundred One becoming part of uh, English law, uh, when the UK joined the European Communities, um, it would not have been actionable uh, in common law, and it's never been actionable in equity. Now, my learned friend points out that, of course, cartel conduct is now actionable. Um, it is prohibited by statute. Things have changed. Standards have changed. And, and that may be right. Um, but uh, as I said before, um, Parliament has prohibited this conduct. Common law has stepped in and provided a remedy. In addition to that, Parliament has provided extensive legislation providing for additional remedies going beyond those that were provided at common law. So, you know, we now have class actions, for example, um, where you don't even need to prove um, individual loss specific to the, the, the claimants, you could, the class members. You can get an aggregate award of damages. Um, various presumptions have been brought in by legislation. Um, uh, th there is actually prospectively a prohibition on claims for exemplary damages, um, for example, in the Competition Act. Um, doesn't apply to this case, but that's by the by. Um, so, th 
there is lots of legislation about cartels um, and about the relief that can be provided for the victims of cartels, um, and um, uh, and that is available uh, to the claimants. Um, but however flexible the, the concept of fraud in equity may be, um, and whatever Lord Brandon might have had in mind, there is no support anywhere for the proposition that equitable fraud extends to the serious and intentional and deliberately concealed breach of a statutory prohibition. That's really the proposition that Melanifer needs to establish. And there are lots of statutory prohibitions out there. Not all of them sound in damages, um, but the tort of breach of statutory duty has been out there for a long time. Um, and if it were right um, that equity actually provides relief for a breach of statutory duty as well, that's something that you might have thought that would have left some imprint in the law reports, and it just doesn't. The learned friend has shown you a few cases, old cases, about expansive meanings um, of uh, fraud. Mostly, actually, when you go through them, they're breach of fiduciary duty, so that can't be what Lord Brandon had in mind. Um, but putting it at, at, at its highest, there was nothing that went further than conduct that is prohibited by equity or to which equity will attach um, its sanction. Um, and so that's why this is not a fraud claim. Um, what this is, is a cartel damages claim, which is shorthand for a common law claim for breach of statutory duty. Um, so subject to the various other defenses that we have at trial, the claimants are entitled to compensation for any losses that they suffered, and that would include loss of use of money. Um, but they're not entitled to a gratuitous windfall in the form of compound interest for the period in which they were not trading and in which they didn't suffer any losses at all. So, my lords, uh, unless, um, uh, my lords, my lady, unless you have any questions, those are my submissions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. as brief as I can. As a matter of fact, it's my submission that it's intrinsic to the success of a price-fixing cartel that it's secret. That's why it's concealed. In this case, there is no dispute that it was secret. I think it, that's, I think that, that's in the decision. It's also not in dispute defendants acted in breach of competition law, unlawfully. And our case is that even after the cartel ended, in and around, I think, 2006, it continued to conceal it. That's actually also the issue that's going to be dealt with on a limitation to when there's been concealment, just to defer the running of time. So in this case, by reason of that this concealment, the defendants who have incurred a liability by reason of their participation in the cartel avoid having to pay and meet that liability. They're able to retain money that they have that they shouldn't have. They're able to hold it effectively adverse to my clients. And they're able to make a profit from it. We say the money is therefore obtained and retained by fraud. Equity should allow compound interest in that situation. Now, the other point is the the joint and several point. The point I made before to all the gentlemen um, in my previous submissions about the benefit to the cartelists overall being potentially a mirror, not an exact mirror, of the loss suffered by my clients is right as um, the Justice Mayor noted that there's a claim for losses referable to non-participant uh, non um, panels and also for participant panels. And the judge at trial will need to identify the losses in, under those headings. Insofar as that losses are calculated by reference to the participant panels, so the increase in prices by reason of those who are part 
participants in the active participants in the cartel, we would say compound interest should be paid in respect for that. Now, so the benefit to the cartelists overall is not mirrored by the losses to your clients, is it? But the losses by all participants in the market. Yes, that's right. Yes, sorry, I was, I was confusing. And here, we're claiming for our losses, and to the extent that the all of the active participants in the cartel are liable for the participant panel claims, we say that there's a joint and several liability on them, and there's no reason why they, why the defendant should be liable for compound interest. If we could claim it against another cartelist, we should be able to claim it against them. My learned friend, um, what he called the claimant's claimant money point, he, he said that this court should accept the obituary observations in Black and Davies as to the requirement that money should that's received is belonging to the claimant. We don't see in that case, which was overturned, not subject to broad argument, and where it wasn't even necessary for the court to consider whether it needs to be belonging point was that the defendant in that court claim hadn't <coughs> received anything but from anyone. There's no discussion in that authority as to why they said use the word belonging. As when one reads it, the Court of Appeal refer to La Pintada and refer to Westerwicher and believe they're just applying Westerwicher. Now given that those two authorities don't themselves either discuss and make this point about needing to require the belonging money belonging to the claimant. To my submission, one has to be very cautious about the suggestion that an obiter point, which wasn't actually germane, even if it had been received, has now set out the boundaries um, of what the actual jurisdiction is. And My learned friend said, he made much of the submission that interest, compound interest, is not compensatory. And he said that my clients were not trading at the end of the relevant period or after they entered insolvency. And so what they're trying to do is to claim a loss that they haven't suffered. And he took them to the devilish case. Um, but on that logic, in a claim for deceit, a non-trading victim, non-trading claimant victim, who's not able to claim under Sempra Metal's basis would not be able to claim compound interest either. Damages for deceit are compensatory as well. And there is a case, the Mann case, where damages were awarded for, for deceit. The contract wasn't set aside, as my own friend fairly admitted. And compound interest compound interest was awarded. Now, my learned friend says that you should not treat that authority as establishing that it's possible to obtain compound interest without rescinding the contract. And he says that because of his, because it, he needs to say that the basis for obtaining compound interest is effectively a remedial response to a proprietary claim. Okay. But of course, in man, that wasn't the point that was held. Nobody said that. So what he's seeking to do without authority is to induce, introduce yet a further gloss beyond the belonging words, a further gloss onto Lord Brandon's dictum. Now, my learned friend's submission, compound interest is only available in cases of fraud where money is obtained and retained by the defendant and if the money was received by the defendant under a contract, the defendant has set aside that contract. Now that's not what was said. And, and of course, in Crown and Johnson, it appears that it was a contract case. And 
what the court, what the Privy Council said there, there was no suggestion when it made its observation that in cases of um, where money is obtained and claimed by fraud, that compound interest would be interest would be available in equity and at law. No suggestion that you needed to set aside a contract. And of course, rescission is an equitable um, remedy. So in Crown and Johnson when it was said that interest was available both at law and in equity, can't have been intended to be saying where you've set aside or rescinded a contract. Because if you can get it at law, compound interest in that circumstance, or interest in that circumstance, you, you won't have rescinded it. So what my learned friend is doing in my submission is trying to introduce a great deal of complexity or, or, or new angles into this underdeveloped area. Um, I, I turn then to, to the ground two in the fraud point. Um, much was made by my learned friend that it's not pleaded, um, that, 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 plead, that concealment isn't pleaded as part of the cause of action. The cause of action has already been established because of the nature of the decision of the commission. There were concerted practices we say the concerted practices included the concealment, the necessary step in order. The concerted practices to have the effect of distorting competition, because otherwise it couldn't work. So it's unsurprising that in the way the claim is pleaded, one doesn't plead out all of those sorts of points. Now, My own friend didn't address, at least not head on, the example I gave of a person who obtains money under a legal contract who then commits a fraud who then retains money. Didn't address why it is that that does not give rise to the right to compound interest in equity. And my submission is telling him why he didn't, that he didn't. And my submission is it's a point that quite clearly has significant force. Lord Brandon be surprised to find that a defendant can, by misleading the claimant, hold on to the claimant's money and then say, I don't have to pay compound interest. But it is the claimant's money. Oh, on, yes, on that particular point. Yes, on, the, on that particular example. Um, now, my, my Lord, on, on ground one, my learned friend took you to two cases I also showed you, Norris and Goldshield. Um, those cases are about, in the, first, in the first instance, about whether or not there was a crime, a common law, by being voted involved in concerted practices. And the second was about what are the requirements for an indictment for criminal offence of conspiracy to defraud. They do not touch upon, the, in my submission, the issue we have here. And as my learned friend said, in Norris, Court was looking at cases before cartel conduct became prohibited. And there was that authority he was shown where it was said oh, it was perfectly lawful, perfectly honest. And my, my Lord Lord Justice Bean, you said, astonishing. My submission, that's the point. Equity today, <coughs> in my submission, would regard such conduct as being within equitable fraud. That is by reason of the nature of the world we live in today. Now, my learned friend in my submission also went a little too far on that because you can even see in that case that contracts in restraint of trade might be unenforceable because equity took, set its face against those. So equity hasn't always sat there and said, oh, this is all fine. Equally, if there are aggravated factors, fact features, then that could also have even been criminal in the past. Now, pursuing, in my submission, pursuing one's own commercial interests at the expense of the public at large, where that is um, precluded by law, in my submission, is something that equity would regard today as fraud. I, I ought to, though, show you one point in Gold Shield, if I may. It's paragraph 19. Two. A bundle two. Tab nineteen and page 
745. It's in paragraph 18. And it said the voluminous material in the prosecution case contains within it quite sufficient notes of aggravating elements consisting of allegations of lies and positive deception. So positive deception is identified as an aggravating element. If we then read down to the part that my learned friend relied upon, the sentence beginning, it goes. It goes on the incorrect assumption that price fixing when carried out in circumstances of secretive and deceptive behaviour is dishonest in itself. Now, we've already seen that positive deception is an aggravating factor. My suspicion, the point here is they didn't plead the positive deception. They didn't plead the aggravating factor. That's all that's being said here. If you're going to put forward a sustainable indictment, you have to establish what it is that you're relying upon. You've got to identify it. So it doesn't support my learned friend's submission that, to my, that um, unlawful cartels are, are not dishonest. Well, they go on in the next paragraph to say that it is capable of amendment and send it back to the judge to decide whether to allow an amendment. Yes. So it turns really on a pleading. It's a pleading point entirely. It's not authority for the relevant propositions. two-hour hearing on a Friday afternoon in December, the judge valiantly, to my submission, sought to reach a decision on what is an incredibly complicated issue that hasn't been properly or fully explored. To my submission, that wasn't an appropriate way to respond. And my submission, his decision, therefore, cannot stand. And in fairness to the judge, of course, I have developed my arguments by running round one with my submission, this isn't a case where it's appropriate to strike out pre-trial, where the trial is imminent, a claim for compound interest. Now, as my learned friend says, um, interest won't even arise if we don't prove our losses. If we do prove our losses, then there'll be a consequential issue about interest. And in my submission, the person who will be best placed to consider that claim be the judge, the trial judge. And so, uh, unless I can assist the court further, those are my submissions. Um, can I just ask to clarify one point? You may already have um, explained this, but I think it's inherent in what you were submitting at the beginning of your reply, that it is intrinsic that the cartel is secret, that um, possibly contrary to what you accepted before the judge, um, the operation of a cartel would be enough to attract um, compound interest in equity. Is that yeah. right? Yes, that's ground one. Yes. I thought that was where you were. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Apologies if I wasn't clear on that. Well, you probably were. Probably. But anyway, it's I have said it's, a lot. It's clear so now. It's, it's clear now. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your assistance. Um, I gave permission for the hearing to be transcribed that on the usual terms, which is when the transcript is available, it should be sent to court um, uh, via our clerks and also to whichever side hadn't commissioned it, um, so that it's available to all of us. Um, we will uh, reserve judgment. We'll send out draft judgments in the usual way uh, as soon as we can. Um, as counsel well know, but I'm obliged to remind people in every case, there are two points to be made about the draft judgments. Firstly, that they are to be confidential until the formal hand down to the parties, their directors, their legal advisors, um, and not disseminated more widely until the formal hand down, see the master of the rolls' position in the Council General for Wales's case. And 
secondly that the draft is sent out not for re-argument but for correction.